Better Call Saul has always separated itself from Breaking Bad by identifying with the label of slow burn. The series has oftentimes shown character development by seemingly innocuous decisions, and Breaking Bad did do some of that as well, but the stakes were always life and death for Walter White, which led to many all-or-nothing decisions with explosive consequences. But being the final season of Better Call Saul, the dominoes that have been so carefully set up by the writers are beginning to fall. Almost all of the characters are walking on Razor's Edge. Gus and Mike are no longer just secretly managing the construction of a super lab, they're standing face to face with Lalo Salamanca. Jimmy and Kim are no longer conning Boris stockbrokers, they're trying to trick highly intelligent lawyers who have a long history with both of them. One slip up has major consequences, and that's what the showrunners really wanted us to feel in Carrot and Stick. So let's begin with a little casualty watch. Bullets started flying in Carrot and Stick, but it was the character moments surrounding the visceral action that made Nacho's fight for life so impactful. The first image of the episode that I think strongly hints at where we're headed is this one right here. The way the ID cards are shown to us in such a binary way makes me think that at some point, there will be a binary choice for Mike to make. Does he save Nacho, or does he save the father? Nacho chose to be in the game, his father did not. That difference usually determines how Mike approaches a violent situation ethically, but Mike has a long history with Nacho, so it would not be a simple choice if the save one man scenario comes to pass. Carrot and Stick was one of my favorite Mike episodes in a long time because of what they do with him visually, specifically his interaction with the lighting. Mike is in the midst of an identity crisis. He's chosen to be a soldier for an extremely cold and calculating man who expects complete subservience and that aspect of Gus is being exacerbated by Lalo. After Gus figures out that Lalo is alive, we get this image that shows a man struggling to hold himself together, and then in a very out-of-character moment, he accidentally knocks over a glass, causing it to shatter. This is not the same Gus we see in Breaking Bad. He's a little younger, a little bolder, and more volatile, which makes any disobedience from Mike all the more dangerous. Now at the beginning of the episode, we get this beautiful shot as Mike talks to the girls. The girls are covered by a little light, but Mike gets full silhouette treatment. This is meant to show that his personal identity when working for Gus is washed away. He's just another man with a gun, wearing black, following orders from Gus. In other words, he's just the grumpy old man version of Victor and Tyrus. But Mike does the job as commanded, even though it's a bit uncomfortable for him. But later in the episode, when Gus commands that Nacho's father be brought to him, Mike breaks out of the empty persona he adopts when he works for Gus which is represented by this outrageous image. I mean, my god, they are not messing around this season. Tyrus's identity is gone. He's just an extension of Gus's will. But when he points the gun at Mike, he's facing down a man who still has the ability to be something more. It's a remarkable act of courage by Mike, standing up to Gus in that moment, and it's an act that helps prevent the shadow from taking complete control. And a quick note on the shootout before we move to Symbol of the Week, it's clear that Gus had a gun given to Nacho because he wanted him to die in a shootout with the cousins, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Now, we could have had Nacho killed by the hitmen after he let them in, but I'm not sure if that's a plot hole or if Gus wanted to use Nacho to take Marco and Lionel off the board. Gus makes the identical move in Breaking Bad to take out the cousins, and it ends successfully. The problem for Gus and for Lalo is that Nacho is just too resourceful, tenacious, and intelligent to be manipulated. He was never going to just obey Tyrus when he saw the situation evolving. Nacho has observed almost every player in the game. Gus, Lalo, Hector, Tuco, Mike. He knows how these people think and operate, which makes him a very slippery proposition. And the shot to close the action, by the way, stunning. Once again, I got a Coen Brothers vibe. The dominoes at the beginning were a strong contender for Symbol of the Week, but it was edged out by the inflatable Statue of Liberty being used by the Kettlemans to promote their criminal tax business. The same inflatable that Jimmy will eventually use for his criminal law firm. Criminal law firm. Lady Liberty is a symbol of justice, and justice is what Carrot and Stick is all about in regards to Jimmy and Kim and the divide forming between them. The very first shot that features the happy couple is a brutal one. If you were to teach a course on how camera movement can communicate a message, this would be an automatic inclusion. We start on Jimmy's face, and the pullback and focus shift to Kim takes what feels like an eternity. 
The technique is being used to emphasize how far apart the two are becoming emotionally, and also how Jimmy is moving to the background of Kim's world. So the quest to get the Sandpiper money now brings Jimmy and Kim back to everyone's favorite couple, the Kettlemans. And speaking of the Coen brothers, Craig gives off Major Larry from A Serious Man vibes, but I love him. I think he's a great comedic presence. The Kettlemans play a fascinating role in the episode. They're victims of Kim and Jimmy's con, but Jimmy and Kim perceive them very differently and try to approach them very differently, hence the title of the episode. Now getting back to Lady Liberty, what's perfect about the symbol is the fact that it's a cheap knockoff of something that has serious meaning. It was created to have the general shape of the real thing. You know what it's supposed to represent, but it's been reduced to the bare bones essential characteristics. Torch, tablet, and crown. That's what I think this specific shot is about. There's something off, for lack of a better term, about the way the Kettlemans and the Goodmans view justice. Something decayed. For example, the Kettlemans think that they've been wronged by those who were supposed to help them, and they see justice as reclaiming the life they used to have, even if it means taking advantage of people. And Jimmy has always shared the Kettleman's self-serving view of justice to a certain extent. He himself has taken advantage of people to secure what he believes is a just result for himself. To use his own words to the Kettleman's, I have an angle called justice. It's Kim's view of justice that is the most intriguing in the source of the episode's conflict. Her view of justice is much more rigid and severe. There are people like Mr. Acker and the client Kim mentions in episode 1 that she perceives to be true victims of injustice. And Kim, who's now sporting a darker wardrobe, has turned into someone who's willing to venture into ethical gray areas to right the wrong. So it's a the-ends-justify-the-means worldview. And people like the Kettlemans and Howard are free to get bulldozed if it means a just result for the truly victimized. And I love how when Kim enters the Kettleman's business, she looks around a bit as Jimmy talks and then lurks silently on the couch, but when Mrs. Kettleman says, we didn't deserve any of this, she snaps. She can't take another word. And Kim is right as far as I'm concerned to remind them of how far from the bottom they truly are. And that brings us to the final major decision of the episode, which is Jimmy's decision to give the Kettleman's the money that he got from Lalo. Now, why would he help out such a corrupt couple? For starters, he does not share Kim's harsh view of justice. And I think he had sympathy for the Kettleman's after Kim demolished them with extreme prejudice, but I do believe there's a more personal reason as well. The night before Jimmy and Kim go off to meet the Kettleman's, they discuss what approach they're going to take, and on Jimmy's nightstand is The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. I've not read the book, so there may be some thematic elements I'm missing, but I think it's just the concept of a time machine that the writers wanted to insert. And next to the book is Jimmy's pinky ring, a symbol of his corruption. I suspect that like the Kettleman's, Jimmy is yearning for a return to a different point in his life. A time before his journey to the desert, a time when his brother was still alive, and a time when he and Kim were on better terms. It'd be impossible to mark a specific point, but everything apart from his bank account is having serious problems, so who could blame him for his desire for change? And I think when Mrs. Kettleman declares her desire for things to go back in time, I think Jimmy feels her sentiment on a deep level. The ending of the episode asks a question about Kim's concept of justice. How far is she willing to go to achieve it? If the driver of the car ropes her into the criminal underworld, would she be willing to make a deal with the devil to get the money she desires to expand her practice? And if she's willing to work with Lalo or someone associated with him, how will Jimmy react? Both very intriguing questions. For facial expression of the week, there really could only be one winner, and that was the look Hector gives Gus to basically say, Lalo's alive and you're screwed. Hector did have the option to keep Lalo's status ambiguous, he could have chosen not even to look at Gus, but instead he wanted to strike fear into Gus, which he does successfully. More than anything, I think Hector's look shows how much confidence he has in Lalo's ability to win this war. He's clearly the nephew that he has the most respect for. And I can't even imagine what Hector's reaction would be if Lalo is indeed killed this season. It's going to be devastating. Before I wrap things up, I do want to say, as great as Carrot and Stick was, there was one thing that drove me absolutely crazy and to be honest, almost destroyed my entire viewing experience. Vince Gilligan takes the time to put smudges on the refrigerator door, then puts some cleaning spray in the frame with Mike, and doesn't have him clean it off. Every other disaster in the house can stay, but my god, 
Someone needs to clean those smudges off at some point this season. It's going to be hard for me to endure. All right, if you have any thoughts on Carrot and Stick, make sure to let me know in the comments. And if anyone's read The Time Machine and is seeing some thematic connections between the stories, definitely elaborate on that a little bit. But thank you so much for stopping by. Subscribe to be notified of more Season 6 content. And have a fantastic rest of your day. I will talk to you soon.